I, I come from the organic industry, but I'm one of the founders of Regeneration International, as, as is Larry, Tim LaSalle, Ronnie Cummings. And the reason why we called it Regeneration is because we want an umbrella for all the like-minded farming types. And that, that includes agroecology, permaculture, ecological agriculture, holistic grazing. There are a lot of types of regenerative agriculture. What I really want to do is get across the urgency and the seriousness of what, why we are here today. Last year we reached 400 parts per million for the first time ever in our records. Then this means that if we, can, if we stabilise CO2 at that level in the atmosphere, we will be between 3.5 to 5 degrees warmer. If we get up to 450 parts per million, that is regarded by, as consensus by many scientists as the point of no return. We go into catastrophic climate change and we don't go back. The, at the moment, CO2 is increasing at two parts per million per year. So we've got about 25 years. Actually, we've really got 24 years to get to avoid this. <coughs> Tim showed you a shorter version, went back to 400,000 years. We only have ice core records to 800,000 years. We have no data before that. Hopefully this year we will have data back to a million years from the greenhouse ice cap and from Antarctica. But given 800,000 years, and, and as a species, We've probably been around for 150,000, 200,000 if you really stretch it. But as you can see, we're in territory that we have never been in before and probably the planet hasn't been in before. We have no data as to you know, what happened before this. So you know, what we're in is an incredible unknown crisis. The, what I want to put here is that even if we went to renewables tomorrow, which unfortunately we won't, but even if we did and we capped where we are now, we head towards catastrophic climate change. And the best analogy I can give you is if we're in a boat and we have a leak, it's sinking, we have to do two things. We have to plug the leak, but we also have to bail out the water. Most of the talk we have is about plugging the leak, and we haven't plugged the leak. The leak is actually worse now than it ever has been. And we're barely bailing out the water. So, you know, if you, you know best way to say it, you know, we're on a boat that is sinking rapidly and we need to work rapidly. The World Meteorological Organization explains it's like, it's like this. The 400 parts per million we have in the atmosphere now you know, that is not even really starting to affect us now. There's a lag time between 50 to 100 years when that will affect us and affect the planet. The, but what I really want to get across is this. At the moment, we are over one degree warmer than the pre-industrial times. But we're, we're 1.25 degrees last year warmer. And people go, oh, what's one degree warmer? You know, it, Winters are a bit milder, summer's a little bit hotter, we can turn up the air con. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> okay, yeah, we're good now. Um, but the best way to explain it, to heat up a, a whole planet's atmosphere is equivalent to million, the energy from millions of atomic bombs. I want you to get that image because what we're doing now by putting all that energy into the weather system, we are driving it to make it more extreme. And this is what's happening now. We've, we're seeing longer droughts. We're seeing rain events that are more destructive. And then we're seeing, well, according to NASA, one, um, one in 30 year events are happening one in every five year events. But as of last month, that changed. When, Houston, when Harvey hit Houston, that was a one in 500 year event. 
And when they looked at the maths, since the 1970s, Houston has been having one in 500 year events, one in 15 years. Two weeks after Harvey, there's Irma. That's a one in 1,000 year event. And two weeks after Irma, we have Maria. That's another one in 1,000 year event. And we're seeing this all around the world. Harvey gets press because it's hit North America. But when you hear about something like uh, Cyclone Haiyan hitting the Philippines and killing thousands of people, that hardly registers. And, and similar ones are going to Bangladesh and other places. These, what we call super hurricanes, super typhoons, super cyclones are the norm. But what is frightening is that, you know, these are the little ones. They're only going to get bigger and worse. The, so what we have to do with urgency is take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. This is uh, a scenario that has been put up after Paris. The steep red line into the red is where we are going at the moment. The lowest line is if every country started living up to, to its Paris Accord, its commitments. And at this stage, there's not very many that are doing that. So if we're lucky, we go somewhere in between. But I want to explain what that somewhere in between means. What I really want to talk about now is what two degrees means. Two degrees warming. That, by the way, people have heard of 350.org. That was put there um, really Th that, that number, oh, thank you. That number, let's see if I'm getting behave this time. Yeah, sorry. The, that number was put there after the Copen Copenhagen climate change meeting when the world agreed to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius. Before the Paris event, a lot of scientists looked at, well, what does two degrees warming mean? And what it means is this, is that a country like Bangladesh, with about 60 million people, goes underwater. And you're going to have 60 million refugees going into India, Myanmar. Think about what's happening in that region at the moment with 400,000 Rohingya refugees going from Myanmar in, into Bangladesh. They can't cope. How do you cope with 60 million? And then let's think about a country like the Netherlands, when it starts to go under, and we're talking about you know, tens of millions, or Miami, New Orleans, Manhattan, in North America, just to name a few, London. And then we go to Asia and we look at the mega cities like Bangkok, 30 million people, Manila, 30 million people, Jakarta, 30 million people. These cities are actually already going underwater in parts. Parts of Jakarta now, when they have king tides underwater, it's rising. You know, what we're looking at are hundreds of millions of climate change refugees. We cannot cope with a couple of million refugees out of Syria. What sort of world will we be looking at? We do not have the resources. On top of that, we're going to have droughts, we're going to have floods. We're going to have, uh, uh, you say, disruptions in food security. The Arab Spring that has caused all the problems in Syria and also in Libya, that came about because of droughts and food riots. I want to give you an, an idea of where we are going if we do not turn this around. And so I want spend too much time on this because we're, we're graced with um, Stephen LaFolle when he was French Minister for Agriculture, put this initiative up, which I regard as, as the, the most important initiative that came out of Paris. It has a lot of support. Okay, at this stage we have 42 countries, but the main UN organisations for agriculture are there. You know, we have many NGOs, there are scientists now working on it. 
The main concept behind it is, is that if we could change agriculture from being one of the major greenhouse gas polluters to actually taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it into the soil, we can actually basically manage all the human-generated emissions. So what I thought I'd do is just do a little back of the envelope with um, calculation to see can it be done with what we're doing now. And I'm going to be very conservative compared to Tim in, in terms of the data. So um, I'm, I'm not going to read out all the numbers. People can have this PowerPoint later if you want to check my maths. The main thing I just want to say is that we need to essentially strip out 15 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year to get rid of the two parts per million that we're putting up every year. If we do that and we go to renewables, this is the other very important thing, so we stop putting it up in the atmosphere, we can turn it around. We get a lot of people actually get very sceptical, say, oh no, agriculture can't do it, because if you look at a lot of it, of agricultural practices at the moment, at best they can slow down the rate of carbon loss. But there are good peer-reviewed examples. As I said before, we use the word regenerative agriculture to describe numerous systems that can do it. I come from the organic sector, so I want to give some of the data from our sector. And here we are. Just to show some of the, the studies the first one is a very good peer-reviewed journal looking at different studies in Mediterranean climates in Europe, the USA, and in Australia. And on average, they found that these organic systems sequestered around 3,500 kilos of carbon dioxide per year per hectare. Uh, when Tim was the uh, CEO, executive director of Rodale, uh, one of their long-term trials, it was doing about the same. We have another one uh, in 30 years of data in, in, Sikkim, in Egypt, and it's about the same. If we extrapolate them by the United Nations figures for agricultural land, that means we could, we could sequester 17 gigatons per year. Now, I'm not using this as scientific proof. What I'm trying to get across is that these back-of-the-envelope calculations are very good to see, is such a concept feasible? Then, I want to use another one. Tim actually showed you this as a graph. On his um, graph, he showed this is actually lower end. I'm using this as a higher end. That when we start getting from going from before what we call a good practice to a better practice and adding compost, the amount, you know, if we extrapolated that, we're talking 40 gigatons. So there's a lot less farmland we need to convert. That's what Tim is trying to explain. The, this is being naughty, you know. As Tim and both Ronnie said, actually two thirds of agricultural lands are actually grazing, rangelands. And to give you an example from you know, the peer-reviewed literature. We, we don't have a lot at the moment, but we're starting to get more. This is uh, degraded lands in Arizona. And when they brought in regenerative grazing, holistic grazing, the, the amount that, the, that they sequestered per hectare, if we extrapolated by grazing lands, that's 98 gigatons. So I'm trying to show here that we have systems that if we start to adopt them, we can change this and change it quite rapidly. And one of the things that you'll see over the next two days, we've got some of the best exponents of this in the world here. You're very lucky. You, you'll, you'll see that we can do it. I think the other thing I want to talk about, everybody else has talked about how we sell it to farmers. I am a farmer, and it's of great interest to me. But the other side of it as a farmer is, you know, I, I want to be paid for what I'm doing, and I want to get you know, my fair share. How do we get the consumers to buy in to support the products from these regenerative farming 
systems. And from my point of view, as someone who's actually been very much involved in certification schemes, the, you know, virtually every carbon scheme has failed. I mean, many of them just fail completely, they go away. Uh, other ones are just there, but they really don't make an impact. You see them on the side of a, of a carton or a packet, but really consumers don't seem to be interested in buying, paying extra for products that are labelled climate change friendly. That is what we're dealing with. So how do we get them in? And when, you know, when we look at the ecological eco brands, the one that has the lion's share of the market is organic. And I agree with Tim that organic is not a good brand name with other farmers. They're very sceptical. But with consumers, it's the one they know and trust. It's a different, you know, we have to do one lot of, one lot of messaging for farmers, but we need another lot of messaging for consumers. And, you know, it is the fastest growing one. It's worth 80 billion, it's having an impact, and it's growing at double digits. So, an example, this is Forbes magazine, 2015, talking about how big business lost $4 billion in the US to organic. All of them are now rushing and buying organic brands. They want to be part of it. It is, you know, organic, and I know it because I'm the international president. We are growing quickly in 186 countries around the world at the moment. Yeah, but we also want to know why is it growing? What is the driver? And it's not environment. When, when we question people, it's health. And when we break down health, it's about avoiding pesticides, artificial colouring, preservatives. These are the drivers of consumers. And why I want to say this is because if we want consumers to start buying regenerative products, and if they find pesticide re revenues, uh, re residues, you know, we lose all credibility with them. It is really important that our regenerative systems don't use pesticides and very importantly differentiate themselves. The, and I want to end on this because, this is, because we're all consumers and to explain where the science is now and why the consumers are right. We have good science, very good peer-reviewed science showing that pesticides um, damage uh, developing children. That, and that's from the fetus, growing children, and teenagers when they're going through puberty. Here's some of them. Um, I should have also put in, in hormone disruption as well. That's, a, that's a, another major issue in there. I'm not going to read, read them all out. You can read it. But I just want to show you an example, and one of the most major ones at the moment we have is glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup. This is a peer-reviewed paper that I was a co-author of, and we looked at, we actually found 23 diseases in the United States that tracked very closely to the increase in glyphosate. That increase in glyphosate has come from the introduction of Roundup-ready plants, and glyphosate has gone through the roof. We know now it's in nearly all our bodies. It's the new DDT. It's found in most foods. It's everywhere. When we did this, we actually had some of the data to explain why, but people would say, look, correlation is not causation. The, we did actually what's called a um, Pearson's uh, correlation coefficient, which is where you look at the probability that they are linked. And the ones we chose, the probability that they aren't linked is 1 in 10,000. So if that was a drug and you had that sort of um, correlation, it would, they would be immediately be investigating it. But as a pesticide, you just rubbish it. But I want to show you that two years later, last year, this came out, and this is peer-reviewed. And what this shows is that the smallest amount of glyphosate damages the developing nervous system in the fetus. 
ingrown children, teenagers. And you can see the difference between what should normally be in terms of nerve development and how the glyphosate severely damages it, it stops the nerves from growing properly. And so here now we ha actually have a very strong biochemical pathway and causal pathway why the glyphosate and autism are linked. Because the brain is our biggest area of nerves. And the smallest amount of glyphosate is doing this to developing children. The, I want to end on the other thing here is that when we look at children in particular, what's happening now is that everybody is getting a cocktail of pesticides in your food. Not just one or two things, there's a cocktail. And the data we have is shows that these are synergistic and they cause problems. At this stage we have no scientific data, published data, evidence-based data, that any level of these cocktails are safe for children. The data we do have shows that there are no lower levels. There are no um, safety levels. You know. So what I want to end up is on here is one of the really common pesticides in our food, chlorpyrifos. And this is MRI scans of the brains of children. Now, where the mothers ate food, the good, you know, the normal American diet, and they got chlorpyrifos, you can actually see through MRI scans the actual areas of damage in the brain now, we, at this sort of level. They, and what I want to get home here is that you know, mothers feel they're eating good fresh fruit and vegetables is good for their children, but the pesticide residues have done this to their children. And this is what we're doing to our next generation. So what I want to put forward here is that the way we need to change farming is it goes from being a major problem for climate change to a major solution. And at the same time, we also build an agriculture that gives us a healthy future. Thank you.